Welcome everybody to this episode of Manufacturing Talk Radio. I'm Tim Grady and I am here with Mark Donalek with Pivot International. Mark's been on our show before, had a very interesting conversation with him. Mark, I would just like to welcome you to the show and have you kind of refresh our listeners' memories of Pivot International. Sure. Well, it's a pleasure to be here and appreciate the invite back. Um, yeah, Pivot International is a product design and manufacturing services company. We uh, we we seek clients who, who seek us to they have a need in a product need in mind or a manufacturing need or both, and we we will start from the idea, the inception of the idea of the product, and we'll go through a full prototype design, design for manufacturing, right into manufacturing, and we'll deliver the product wherever they want it delivered to. So we're very much a turnkey service provider. Uh, we're global. We have offices around the world, engineering and manufacturing. And uh, we uh, we take the lead right from the start of what the need is, try to help them write the requirements if that's necessary. And we go right from there. And uh, we have sourcing around the world and manufacturing as well. So it um, gives us uh, a nice foothold in this challenging time we've all been through with boots on the ground around the world. It has helped us a great deal. That's great. Now, Mark, quick question for you. Uh, there are lots of people with ideas for product. I have one. <laughs> Do you serve the individual or are you typically working with uh, people who are more well-funded, uh, you know, further down the pipeline? Really all the above. We serve startup type firms like you're, you're citing there. We serve middle, middle market companies, you know, 20 to $50 million annual revenue have some capacity to run their business, of course, but don't maybe have the scale of engineering or manufacturing or both. And we work with large corporations as well. But really, we it's a pretty equal mix. It's um, We have all, all startups are exciting because it's brand new products, sometimes brand new technologies, and they're full of excitement and they're raising money as they come to us for a try to, a lot of, many times it's to, to provide a functional prototype to prove out their concept. And then they, they seek uh, Series A and Series B funding to go to the next step. And then we move in our core market of middle market companies that are really a nice sweet spot for us. And then we do business with billion dollar firms as well. You would think those size firms would have everything we do, but they, they often don't. So, so it's, a, it's a nice distribution. Well, I can understand uh, over the years, I've worked with a number of companies who as you said, you would think that they would have the design people, the engineering people, the uh, the pre-production people so that they could come up with new products. But you're not always coming up with new products every day. Right. That's right. So they're, they're not going to hold on to those people. They're going to look for somebody like Pivot International. Right. Right. That's exactly right. That's exactly the. And we might be in a niche they don't even have technical know-how on. Or they're they they they're out of capacity internally. Um, but like you say, you're not always developing brand new products. So a lot of it's sustaining engineering folks that they have on staff. So it makes a difference. So Mark, uh, I come into the conference room. And here, this is in my head. Uh, what I expect to see is here's Mark at the table, and then there are three, four, five, six other guys and gals uh, with their various expertise. Kind of walk me through the development cycle from concept to completion. Sure, we'd well, yeah, be happy to. We, we will engage with the client. They'll seek out a need or a desire they have, and we often sit hand in hand and help them define what they're trying to look for in a performance standpoint and get into an act actionable type um, uh, document or process so we can define what they're trying to do. Many times that's where the challenge is, particularly in the startup to middle market firms they don't necessarily have the skill set all the time of knowing how to define these sort of things from an engineering manufacturing standpoint. So we have to work with them to help them to ask the right questions for them to give us feedback. And from that, we, we can gain information to define what we're trying to accomplish. And, and with that, we'll have a collection of uh, engineering account management, commercial people, uh, supply chain folks that all play a part in this this uh, process of that initial engagement. Then from there, we go we go into a, a prototyping activity uh, with the goal in mind, and we have a phase gate engineering process. So it's, it's defined by deliverables. And we go through a prototype. 
we prove out the, the concept, then we go into a menu to a full product design activity, which encompasses also a design for manufacturing segment to it. So that in order to make it repeatable, at a cost you can live with, et cetera. So first you design the product. A lot of people think once the prototype is done, they come to us and say, can you guys, it's ready to go. Can you make it? Well, it's a long ways from being ready to, make, to be manufactured, but they don't know that a lot of times. It, it, the, the general public doesn't understand there's a difference between a prototype that works and a true design product that can be manufactured. So we have to take them through that education process. And that's always a tough one for someone because they're, they're, they have conviction that, that they've proved this prototype out, let's go and make it. Um, and so, uh, but there's material changes, there's all kinds, you know, there's all kinds of things you have to look into. And then once you go in the law started in America with the Asian movement the last 25 years has been this DFM stage. You know, we have engineering design firms in this country, but the knowledge base of a design for manufacturing step before you go into production is a little bit, a little bit of a lost art because that's been outsourced over the last uh, quarter century. And so that's going to be the biggest learning curve as reshoring occurs as it's occurring. Uh, there's that there's that gap of that step because that gives you, you know, regular uh, sustaining manufacturing, repeatability, higher quality control, uh, and a price point you can you can sell the product at. So a couple of things I want to ask you about that process, Mark. The, okay, I come in with my balsa wood model, my prototype, yeah. and of course I either want to build it in plastic or metal. Uh, what's the delta between my balsa wood model and the real deal? Well, the balsa wood model in that type of scenario would be, um, you know, a prototype is going to be, generally is going to be more expensive per unit. One, because it's right. one, and two, because of the kind of materials you're, you're buying and, and also off the shelf type things. So yeah, you can generally, it varies between product, of course, but it's at least four to five to one or even 10 to one a lesser cost than what a per unit prototype is. And it's sometimes many, much more than that. So it really depends on what encompasses it, but it could be very significant. Uh, it's always sizable. Um, because you think about all these variables, better material selection, production ready materials, um, plastic that's been tooled, which is lower cost, but also just the volume. What's, what do you, what's your volume per year? I mean, I want 10,000 a year. Well, you, you, that prototype might be 10 units off the shelf. So it's very significant. And, and so it doesn't really drive your cost assessment for the market at the prototype stage. The prototype stage is designed to say, will this widget work? Is, is my idea conceivable? Then you have to go to stage two, which that proves out the cost point as well as the uh, manufacturing building and all that. Do they ever take mark a prototype and produce enough to uh, you know, prove out that they can manufacture it and begin to tickle and test the market as to whether or not people right. are going to buy it. Right, that's right. And, and often that is the latter is that that's the case. I mean, they they want to put it in front of people to see if there's interest, see if it's to see if there's enough before they really go into a big big serious investment because the prototype investment part is quite minor compared to the next stage for sure. So it's a relatively inexpensive venture. For firm, you know, less than hundred thousand dollars many times. So, so it's um, it's very easy to venture to start to see if if it's viable or not. Mark, what's your view of uh, reshoring in your world? I'm sure that you help your customer source. Mm -hmm. right. And are you beginning to see a shift towards made in the USA sourcing, even though you have offices all over the world? Right. There is there is a trend towards that. It's been a bit overstated in the press at the level of magnitude. You know, everyone wants to do that emotionally, then they don't like the numbers. You know, and so uh, and, and certain <laughs> <laughs> so certain industries are more sensitized to that than others. And particularly, embedded electronics is, are very sensitive to that. Uh, cost is still so important, and 
and we don't sell too many of our customers don't sell too often to the consumer like at Walmart, but but uh, but still it's the same kind of culture. And so the bed electronic industry, but overall though, there's still that there's still that inflection point that people would like to, but you know, they it's gonna take an adjustment. And I think it's part, I think that's partly why we have some degree of the inflation cause, not all of it, but is that some of this impact of reshoring is already being felt. Just excuse me. Shouldn't have gone off. Um, uh, some of this should have been, uh, but but um, uh, but some of the inflation mitigation was the globalization as well. And right. so, so we're going to have to live with that that headwind as as this trend continues. Because I think it's I think it is going to continue. I think you're not in a single sort move necessarily. But no one's going to be single sourced to the level they were before uh, 2020. I don't think so. And and so, um, but it is there is a trend. I think there's different industries. I think electronics is moving out of China, but not necessarily Asia. Or they're considering Mexico. Uh, they they have a hard. Some of our customers were manufacturing what was it abroad in the United States for sure. Um, Half of our manufacturing capacity is in the United States, so it's um, and so um, so there's more and more of that happening for sure. But um, it's not it's not as immediate as people think, and nor can it be. I mean, realistically, people talk like you hear this on the in the in the national media a lot about why don't such and such company just bring all their stuff back? Why are they dealing with these issues? Well, all the chips in the world are largely originated. From Asia slash China, so right. you can buy it up the street here, but that's not that's not where it originated. It, 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 so that's kind of that's kind of the world we're in, and so but there is there is movement for sure. I think there, there's and there's definitely interest, and people are willing to pay a little more sometimes for U.S. based or Western based. Um, right, but so, it, it's, only, it's just a limit though how far they're willing to go. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so, Mark, you have offices all over the world. Are you also sourcing then all over the world? Yes. Depending yes. On the yeah, we have a head office here in Kansas City, another uh, sizable office in St. Louis for sourcing. We have a Taiwanese office. We have uh, uh, European offices as well. So we source globally. We have boots on the ground in all facets. We're getting a decent amount of sourcing out of Europe as well, believe it or not. So it's not just Asia for electronic components. It's sometimes it's sometimes it's through the channel of Europe through Asia. It, it, you know, a lot of us, a lot of us connections and and relationships and and point of contact. So it's one thing that's really really helped us in this in this difficult three years that we've all kind of had to migrate through is just to have boots on the ground. Local presence is essential. Uh, I, I, people that that went into offshore manufacturing. So, you know, using someone and they developed the product here in the US and they had someone make it and just through an email or an agent, uh, they had a tough go of it uh, during this pandemic. Awesome. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah, it became a very relationship driven yeah, arrangement, I'm so. sure. But you know, I tell so, you, the, the other challenge that people have, not just getting parts, it's the inventory carrying, you probably have heard this. The inventory carrying levels on the average company in, in America have gone way uh, out of sight. I mean, even the large corporations have announced the public ones how high their inventories are running relative to prior period, and that's simply because uh, the last component you've got all the components, and the last component hasn't come in yet, but you bought everything else. And that's, uh, right. That's right. really what's happened. Yeah. Well, it's an interesting statement because we've been talking with some of the uh, people who watch the industry, particularly in the inventory component. And what we're seeing, as you said, was that the inventory levels are very high. So demand to replenish inventory is very low, thus softening the manufacturing industry. And now you've pinpointed a very specific reason why. The last piece you need is right. in the end yet. Right. Oh, absolutely. It could be a 12 cent IC, a component that goes on a circuit board. It often is. It often isn't the biggest thing. It's 
it's often the most one of the least expensive items that are critical to the final product. It's kind of like Ford Motor Company making a car and have all the steel and the engines and the roof and the radio, but they only have three tires. Well, the darn thing needs four. Um, <laughs> 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 it's a funny thing about it. And that's really what, that's part. And then therefore, everyone's got blown inventories and everyone's slow paying everybody because they, they're, they're choking on them. So it's a big cycle that has to get kind of run through here. Um, yeah, it's certainly yeah. another important factor that, you know, the slow pay is becoming a concern, which yep. causes the next uh, customer to get tougher terms. Right, right. Uh, that right. that's closed the cycle. Yeah, you're bringing out some really important points that uh, you and I were talking pre-show, you know, how is manufacturing doing? And these uh -huh. are some of the struggles. Yeah, oh, yeah. And if you, if you the public companies have announced this target a few quarters ago. Indicate their inventories are up forty percent. That's a big number. If you think about Ooh. it. I mean, that's it's a major. So that's just a good example. The uh, and you, you know the automakers are going through it because they were they, they couldn't get LCDs for a while. Um, and for a while they're actually shipping SUVs without LCDs in them, and then they'd run from them later because we know that's in short supply for sure. Um, and so right, so it goes around for everybody. Um, you just have to. You have to muscle through it and and um, and really work your your working capital uh, model heavily because you're dealing with a lot of these different factors. Mark, have you, have you had a particular experience with a finished product? You, you know, your customers already gone through the cycle. Your product is now uh, out, either being bought business to business or business to consumer. That was kind of really kind of fun and unique for you guys. Oh, sure. There was a number of them. It was, um, well, we actually developed a product a few years ago called the, uh, believe it or not, the fish scanner. This was sold in the, the retail outlets. So it was an automatic fish scanner. So these two uh, professional fishermen <laughs> approached us and said, we'd like to have a, a, a device that cleans fish automatically. So we developed it. So it, it, it cleaned the fish, it deboned the fish, and then it got was sold, being sold to Cabela's for a number of years. So that, that was kind of an interesting one. <laughs> the yeah, outside yeah. what we would you think we would do, right? Uh, but yeah, so there was. I don't make you didn't, so you, you never know who you're going to run into. Um, now there's some of the more um, technical products. Oh, that was fairly technical, even though it was. It sounds like it would be a simple thing. Um, you know, there's what's interesting that there's a, a for a, we we developed this device that that tracks that registers your lung capacity and your functionality. Uh, for C COPD, the early detection for COPD, which is right. a real, and so that's we developed that. And it won one of the European awards that we that we we have on our website. And what it does, it, it provides a early indicator to AI metrics, early in indications about those who might have future COPD, and then therefore the physician might be able to do a preemptive treatment for that. And it got enough attention during COVID early days, if you remember the, the run on ventilatory, uh, you know, ventilators. All right. Uh, they, you know, some of the health people were looking at as a potential early predictor who needs to be on a ventilator, who doesn't. So, so that was a very interesting in, in, on the medical side. So it's, uh, so we do get in some very interesting things. Um, it's, uh, I bet you do. Yeah, it's, uh, it's uh, a lot of different people. Um, you know, we're working on, we're completing an IoT product, which is one of the hottest segments of technology right now. Um, and it's 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 for the construction industries. It's to identify all the tools globally, uh, wherever they're at, whatever what job site they can look on their computer screen and see where all this stuff's at. So uh, it, it's it's could be a really exciting product. Uh, so is that more of a research. database application? What's that? Yes. Yeah. We. Yep. That's right. So you could. So you have all these sensors mounted in the field, but then they can sit in central headquarters and see where it's all and for inventory control and for efficiency and 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 and, and just asset management. Yeah, I, I you know as you say that, I'm thinking to myself, if I'm a big construction firm, you know, where are all my graders? And right. Well, that's right. That, that's that's right. That's right. So it's uh, we're pretty excited about that. I think the company's got. Have great success. That was a startup, um, and so what? Uh, wow, it's well funded. You know, it's backed by a good sized firm. So, 
So it's, uh, yeah, we're excited about that. We think that's got a good future. So how do we connect with Pivot International, Mark? Sure, a couple of ways. You can go to www.pivotint.com. That's P-I-V-O-T-I-N-T.com. Or uh, you can always go to Twitter at Pivot INT as well. Super also. stuff. Well, you know, we appreciate you coming back on and kind of giving us an update and a little more depth about Pivot International. You're doing some really neat stuff. So we want to encourage our listeners to reach out. And thanks for joining us, Mark. Well, well thank you. I appreciate the, the opportunity. Always glad to have a guest come back on our show. That's our show for today. And if you would like to watch it, listen to it, or catch any of our other shows, you can find us on Spotify, iHeartRadio, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, and we're also up on uh, YouTube. We're up on Rumble. And you can check us out on AM Radio on WLEA in Cornell, New York. If you're up in that neck of the woods, thank you for joining us for this episode of Manufacturing Talk Radio.